Hi, this is Jackie Aguirre. I am back in South Bend, Indiana at Law School at Notre Dame, and I am the host of the What's Up Latin America series, and with me I have Dr. Rios. Hello, I'm Dr. Dave Rios, a uh, cardiologist here in uh, Kansas City, Missouri. Awesome. Um, if you could just walk us through like a brief background of who you are, where you come from, just a rough. I can do that. So uh, I am uh, the uh, the youngest of seven uh, uh, children, and my both my parents were uh, born in Puerto Rico, but we were all um, born and raised in New York City. Um, actually, my mother uh, died in labor uh, shortly after I was born. And uh, the seven of us were then taken in by my aunt and uncle and my grandmother. And so I was raised primarily by my aunt and uncle, both were Puerto Rican, uh, born and raised in Puerto Rico, and then came to the United States in the like late 40s, early 50s. So my, my aunt that raised me was a nurse's aide, and my uncle that raised me was a, was a janitor in a hospital. And uh, I was born and raised in the Bronx, as I said, the youngest of seven uh, by many years. So my, my siblings are, my older siblings are, you know, 13, 14 years older than I am. So uh, let's see, I, I, uh, I don't know how much detail you want, but I, I spent my childhood in the Bronx and I went to public school through uh, junior high school. And then um, I would say I got what I would consider a, a huge break. Um, there is a program called A Better Chance, which uh, um, sponsors uh, kids from the inner city uh, or provides scholarships for kids from the inner city to go to prep schools. So for high school, I ended up going to a pretty, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I can say prestigious uh, private uh, boarding school in Connecticut called Hotchkiss. And, and that, you know, easily was a, a huge break for me. Uh, um, you know, my, my siblings told me that if, you know, if I did well at Hodgkiss, I could pick my college and they were exactly right. You know, um, so from Hodgkiss, I, I went to Harvard for undergrad. And then from there, I went to Stanford for medical school. Um, then I trained at Mass General for internal medicine, University of Iowa after that. And then I, I've been in practice in Kansas City since 1998. That is the year after I was born. So I just there like to go. throw out fun facts like that to ah. age everybody. Thank you. Thank you. That was nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you're Puerto Rican. Your family's Puerto Rican. Do you speak Spanish? Yes, I speak uh, fluent Spanish. Uh, my, my aunt and uncle spoke only Spanish and, and my grandma spoke only Spanish. So at home, we spoke only Spanish or I guess Spanglish for me. And then, you know, in, in school, obviously we all spoke English, but I grew up, you know, I grew up in a, uh, in the Bronx, I went to a all Spanish speaking, you know, church. And so I, I am very fluent in Spanish, although I, I might, I would say that lately I don't feel as fluent as I once was, but I don't use it as much as I used to, but still fluent. And do you feel a strong connection to Puerto Rican culture? even all this time removed from it? Oh, a hundred percent. You know, I was, uh, I mean, I, I, I identify a hundred percent as being, you know, Puerto Rican, you know, I, I guess I would be classified as New Yorican because I, I didn't, I wasn't born in Puerto Rico, but you know, my entire childhood, all my friends, uh, family, uh, we were completely immersed, you know, all our, our meals were all Puerto Rican food growing up, you know, um, rice and beans and, and then some meat, very little vegetables <laughs> and you know all the holidays were traditional puerto rican holidays and um so yeah i i feel quite connected and 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 to this day love going back to puerto rico i have no family in puerto rico anymore but uh you know i, I love going back there and i love you know I try to cook puerto rican food and try to find puerto rican food anytime i can and uh you know and and, and i get very excited whenever i meet a puerto rican here in kansas city because they're not that many <laughs> yeah uh puerto rico has such like an interesting relationship to america it's you know puerto ricans are american citizens i think that kind of goes over the head of a lot of the general population since puerto rico isn't technically a state 
people don't really grasp that it is still part of the country. Um, kind of a weird power imbalance going on between us and Puerto Rico. We govern Puerto Rico, but they don't have any representation in <laughs> in Congress or the Senate or anything that actually matters. <laughs> um, That's very true. And, 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 you know, for folks that live on the island, it's a big issue. You know, the, the, uh, the politics of statehood versus staying a commonwealth versus independence is a, a huge political issue on the island. But having said that, growing up in New York as a Puerto Rican, the politics of the island were not something that I really was very versed in or frankly, very concerned with, to be honest. Um, uh, you know, Puerto Rico, the island itself is obviously heavily populated, but, you know, in terms of density of Puerto Ricans, New York City probably had more Puerto Ricans than the island does. And now that's probably shifted to Florida. But, you know, so the neighborhood I grew up in, um, you know, we had a bodega around the corner. They spoke only Spanish. In fact, you know, it was weird. I, I used to go, my grandma, you loved her beer and loved her cigarettes. And, you know, five or six years old, I would walk around the corner to the bodega. I'd say, yes, this is for Doña Adela, my grandmother. And they'd give me two bottles of beer and pack of cigarettes, ask no questions. And, and so when I went to college, I was like, what do you mean I can't buy beer? I've been buying beer all my life, you know. <laughs> but, you know, so the neighborhood was, uh, you know, my parents didn't have to speak English in the neighborhood because every, every store they went to, you know, everyone spoke Spanish. And so, um, but yes, the, the politics of the island is, uh, is, is, is an interesting dynamic and uh, it seems to change uh, every once in a while. You know, people shift from being wanting to be independent to wanting to be uh, a state to maintaining the Commonwealth status. Uh, and, and um, you know, I, I don't know where that's gonna end up. You know, obviously Puerto Rico got decimated last year with hurricanes, it would have been nice to have some support from more support from the United States. Um, and I think it still finds itself, you know, the island itself is, it's, it should be a, 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 a agricultural country, but in the 1940s um, and 50s, due to all these tax uh, benefits, all these corporations went into Puerto Rico. And so a whole generation of Puerto Ricans grew up um, with no, no knowledge of, of, of living off the land. And then all those companies left, and now we're left with a huge unemployment and living basically on tourism. And so, you know, the island is a, it, it, it's a, it's a beautiful place. I highly recommend anybody who wants to visit it, but it's a tough place. It's a tough place to live right now. Was there a pronounced cultural shift going from New York and being surrounded by other Puerto Ricans to private school in Connecticut? Yes. Uh, <laughs> You know, I didn't really know what to expect in, 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 in uh, living on camp. You know, first of all, let me just say the idea of leaving home was not one that, you know, my, my brothers, and I have to give a lot of credit to my siblings who were older, they understood that this was a huge break that I needed to take advantage of. I myself was not that interested in leaving home. I didn't want to leave my mom. I didn't want to leave my friends. I didn't want to leave my church. You know, the idea of going and living at a boarding school was not, um, but my brothers convinced me to do it. And, you know, I would say two things about boarding school. Obviously, you know, uh, it was a very affluent group of kids. But what's interesting in boarding school where you don't have cars and you don't have, it was hard to know, you know, I, I didn't, I couldn't tell you who was rich and who wasn't. Uh, the kids didn't seem to dress particularly wealthy. You know, they wore Levi's and, and I guess the clothes was expensive, but I didn't know it. it was Brooks Brothers, but I didn't know what that was. But since there was no way to judge, you know, maybe some kids had stereos, but other than that, there was no way to know, to knowing uh, except for names. Like I, I do remember like my first football practice, you know, I was in the huddle and the kids were introducing themselves and you know, this guy said, yeah, my name is, you know, uh, I think it was a Bill Firestone. I said, oh, that's funny. Like the, like the tires. He goes, yeah, that's my dad. And then the other guy's name was Goulden. I said, oh, well, like the mustard. Yep. That would be my dad. And then I, I, you know, I, 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 there was a girl named Marika Mars, Mars Bars. And then I, 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 I tutored Spanish to a girl named Liz Ford, Ford cars. So all the names were there. And, but because we were all in boarding school, because there was no way of 
kids uh, demonstrating their, their wealth, I really didn't get a sense of how wealthy the kids were. And let me just say, to their credit, the kids were all very friendly. I mean, you know, they knew that I was from the Bronx, and um, uh, but I felt treated, you know, fairly well. Let me just say, um, there were a lot more drugs in prep school than I ever imagined. You know, I was a pretty straight-laced kid, and I didn't do drugs. But they all, when I got there, a lot of kids approached me and said, hey, you know, can you buy me, get, you know, can you access pot for me? I was like, no, no, no idea. But they assumed, you know, because I was from the Bronx that I could get them drugs. Um, so that, you know, the culture shock was huge. Mostly it was a culture shock of leaving home, uh, being in a very academically um, stressful environment, I mean, the amount of work that I had to put in in prep school compared to what I did to get to get good grades in, in public schools was, was different. And so for me, dealing with being away from my family, away from my friends was probably the hardest part. And then adjusting to the, to the level of academics. Um, the kids, I, I have to give them credit. I felt, you know, the kids treated me well. Um, you know, they had some preconceived notions of kids from the inner city and I think I didn't, I never found it to be malicious. I think like with a lot of things, it's just, you know, they never met a kid from the Bronx. So they had their, their preconceived ideas of what that meant, you know, gang member or drug user, which were none of, I mean, I was far from any of that. <laughs> and they learned that quickly, I think. So. It's really interesting. Um, I think phenomenon that goes on is uh, a lot of the times there are pre preconceived notions of both kind of classes, I guess, middle class is kind of disappearing rapidly, but, um, you know, the extremely wealthy and people from the inner city. And in, you know, my experience, I've kind of almost found those to be flipped. Um, I went to a really good public school. Um, I'm, you know, grew up in the suburbs, mm -hmm. went to nice suburban, cushiony uh, schools. And then I came to Notre Dame, which is similarly prestigious, not quite Harvard level, but lots of wealthy people here, lots of big names. And uh, I've never been surrounded by more um, technically illegal behavior <laughs> than yeah. when I was around the extremely wealthy, um, which I find a really interesting kind of flip on things. Yeah, it was weird. I mean, I had, I, I didn't do drugs and like in the, in the Bronx, I'd never seen my, you know, the, the guys I hung out with, we were all into sports and and then when I got to Hotchkiss, you know, I saw my first bong. I had no idea what it was. You know, kids were doing drugs left and right. Um, it, it was, I mean, and like I said, it was just a, it was just a, a, a new world. And like, but as rich as those kids were, I really never noticed until, you know, maybe like spring break, I would hear where they were going, where they were going for spring break versus where I was going. And, and then, you know, you, and then you'd realize, okay, these kids might be pretty, pretty rich. Um, but at the school itself, there were no signs of that other than maybe some kids having nice stereos and, uh, and others. And, you know, and I had this really thick, you know, it's funny. I mean, I had this really thick Bronx accent. Like instead of ask, I used to say ax a lot. And those kids got me out of that. Like, you know, and, and I think, you know, I never felt bad about it. I never felt like I was being teased, but they constantly corrected my, my English, you know, and and that was fine because I needed to learn how to speak proper English. And, um, you know, the teachers were super supportive, I thought, you know. Um, uh, you know, I, I think I was, it was weird because I had skipped uh, eighth grade in, in, in public school. So I came in as a 10th grader. And in retrospect, you know, my parents wouldn't have known this or anybody. But if I had to do it again, I would have gone back and started as a ninth grader in high school. Um, but the experience was, you know, I mean, I, I went there with a goal. I, I knew what I had to do. So uh, after the first six months, I got accustomed to being away from home. And then I just got down to, you know, my job there was just to get good grades. And that's what I focused on. And, you know, I did that at school and I looked forward to going home. I had a couple of close friends, but, you know, my social life and my, all the things I cared about were still back at home. And did you feel any pressure to succeed uh, from your family or just kind of 
to prove yourself, I guess, like knowing you're not there because of money, you're there because of academic abilities you've already showcased. Did you feel any pressure to keep that up there? I I just felt pressure to do well, I mean, for myself. I think I, I really understood that this was like my ticket. And and that was most of my brothers told me that. And and so I went there with a, a goal. You know, I I I knew at an early age I wanted to go to medical school, reasons I don't know why. But so I was very goal oriented. I I went there and I said, okay, if I get good grades here, I want to get into a really good college. And that was that was it. That, I didn't feel super, you know, I had a lot of support at home, you know, um, like when I left prep school, you know, the, as I said, I went to this all Spanish speaking, small little church. And, and I, to this day, I'll never forget this, you know, at the, the weekend I was about to leave, they, you know, they, you know, the church, they bring you up to the front, they let's pray for Dave Rios, he's going off, and they handed me an envelope. And in that envelope was $302, all singles. And the ladies society, the las damas, they had collected that as a gift to me, you know. And I, I was, you know, I mean, these were people that were not in a position to be giving money away, you know. That church was full of, you know, poor, low-income folks. But you know, they they took some pride in the fact that I was going there, and you know, I had just tons of support there. I had tons of support at home. You know, everybody was incredibly proud, and and so. I'm not sure if that put any pressure on me, but I certainly didn't want to, you know, come back, <laughs> you know, be sent back. <laughs> and did your time in Connecticut, do you think, help prepare you for going to Harvard or was that another culture shock? So that's interesting. Academically, it should have, right? I mean, this was like a premier prep school. I, I, uh, I should have been super well prepared academically. What I wasn't prepared for was the social side of being in college. And so at Hotchkiss, I was one, you know, one of two Puerto Rican kids. When I got to Harvard, there were all these other Puerto Rican kids. You know, there were a bunch of kids just like me. And, um, and that was just really refreshing, but it kind of threw me off. And, you know, I, uh, let me just say my first year at Harvard, it was a struggle academically, not because I didn't have the skills, but because I, I, the balance of the social life, the, you know, I had to work study, so I had to work. And the academics, I just never, you know, some kids, uh, you know, got to Harvard and, and, and did that. Well, I, 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 I struggled through my first year and I almost wouldn't ask back. <laughs> you know, it was it was touch and go. Uh, so uh, Harvard was the other thing with Harvard is now I was back in the city. You know, at Hotchkiss, I was out in the country and, you know, it was very controlled. And now I was back in the, the city, which I loved. Um, I had all this freedom. I had to figure out how to balance that. So the academics wasn't the issue for me. It was actually balancing like, wow, there's a social life. I have people like me and, and figuring out how to do all that. And, and then being surrounded by a bunch of really, um, there were some really smart people at Harvard, like, you know, like this guy's, you know, I, I meet some people, I said, okay, that guy's a genius. But there were mostly a lot of people that had studied really hard and knew how to, you know, get A's. Not necessarily super bright, but really good students. And that's what, that's what Harvard was, like 95%. And then there were 5% that were, you'd, you'd talk to them and go, oh, that guy or that gal is a genius, way out of my league. There's this uh, phenomenon called code switching that a lot of black and brown people have to exercise when they go into primarily Caucasian spaces or that a lot of low income people have to exercise when they go into a higher income area. And basically code switching is just kind of uh, representing yourself, almost creating like a different persona. Not necessarily, kind of, it'd kind of be like, do you have a phone voice? where you like talk in a sure, certain way sure. when you're on the yeah. phone or like your waitress or hostess at the restaurant, like that's her professional work right. voice. Um, and it's kind of a, I guess a way to, to make people who aren't at ease in a particular environment, like fit in, in that environment. So like, you know, black people have to deal with this a lot with like, oh, you talk white or like you don't sound black. And, you know, part of that is a is a persona that they've cultivated or have grown up in that kind of 
puts them at ease in, in an environment where they're not around people who look or speak like them. Was that, was that something that you were struggling with your first year is going from, you know, a place where you had been in a mode where you were one of two Puerto Rican kids <laughs> into a different place where you're, you're in a city, there's other people who look like you, there's a lot going on. Did you struggle to find a balance? Yeah, I think I did. I mean, you know, one thing I did when I went to, got to Harvard is, is I surrounded myself with other minority students. I mean, that's who I hung out with. Like everybody I hung out with was either black, Mexican, or Puerto Rican. I had very few, and I loved it. You know, like, I mean, that was, I thrived in that because, you know, they, they got my jokes. I didn't have to change my jokes. You know, I could sometimes, you know, go speak, go back, back and forth from Spanish to English and they would understand, you know, so it was very, very comfortable. And that's what I surrounded myself with at Harvard. And it was great to have that. Um, I, I think I, I did a little too much of that. And, uh, you know, it's just, you know, I, I mean, I've given talks to kids going to college and I, you know, I lost focus of, and I think, especially as a minority, you have to realize that when you go to college, I mean, there's a lot of things out there. And I mean, you know, there's so many opportunities, but you can't forget that your main your job is really to get good grades, right? Because no matter how, what else you do, you're gonna be, eventually you're gonna be judged by your grades, right? Um, if there's a racist professor, right? And you think that he's kind of, you know, or she is, is sort of misgrading you, it's much easier to make that argument when you're a straight A student rather than you're a D student. So, you know, I, I think as much as, you know, you want to take advantage of, a, of like the Notre Dame and all the things that are out there. You cannot lose focus of, you know, the basis. You really have to make sure that you do well, you get good grades, and then you do other things. But, um, and that's what I tell kids when I talk to them about college. I said, listen, there's going to be a lot of things coming at you. You know, there's going to be the social life, there's all the, the politics, right? You get into the politics, you get into the politics of being Puerto Rican at, at, at school. You might, you know, I joined the Puerto Rican Student Union and so on. But through all that, you got to remember that the bottom line is you're there to do well. And you always, uh, if you're doing well, that puts you in a, power, a position of power when you negotiate and talk to people. And I, I kind of lost focus a little bit. <laughs> it happens to the best of us. It does. Um, it does, it does yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm Mexican, as most people who have watched any of this or talked to me for more than five seconds um, are aware. And it's not, we don't really have um, a college going culture. Um, Mexicans don't generally. And it's not because, you know, we don't value hard work or this or that. It's just, you know, First, there's the economic and social right. setbacks that Mexicans and Puerto Ricans and Black people deal with in a primarily Caucasian society. But, you know, on top of that, kind of intertwined with that is for a lot of Mexicans, it's more productive to go to work straight out of school, out sure. of high school, make money so that you can contribute to your family's income, help help pay the bills for your mom so that maybe she doesn't have to work three jobs. Maybe she's only working two now because you're bringing in income. And it's just that short term payoff is, is more necessary than the longer term payoff of sure. paying money to go to college so that right. you can eventually right. make more money. Um, is there, is there a similar, similar phenomenon going on in the Puerto Rican community in your oh, experience? Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, um, you know, I, I think the number of Puerto Ricans that go on to college is, is small, it's a small percentage. And it's mostly driven by economics. I mean, I think, you know, uh, if you cannot, you know, get scholarship money or are willing to take loans, et cetera, uh, you know, it, it's much easier to get into the workforce and make money. And, and, you know, there's something to be said for that. You know, there's, you can help your family. There's some prestige in the community because you're now working and so on. You know, again, I was pretty lucky in that all my brothers, all my, you know, I, the, the road had been laid out for me by my, 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 all, all my older brothers and my sister had gone to college, scholarships or whatever. So it was, you know, it was never, and, and 
And although my aunt and uncle, you know, had a seventh grade and third grade education, they understood and, and instilled in us early on that, you know, your ticket out of the Bronx and your ticket to success is through education. And uh, so it was never, there was never a doubt that I was going to go to college. And, and there was never a question from my brothers or sisters that we were going to go to college. Now, we had no idea how we were going to pay for it, but, you know, we were going to get scholarships. We were going to work. We were going to owe money, but that, that's the way it was. And uh, um, at least in our family, that's the way it was. But, yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, most of the kids in our church, you know, didn't go to college. They went to work after, after high school. But, you know, and I, you know. I say this and I, I don't say it in a joking manner. I mean, for all its for all its issues, the United States is not a bad place to grow up. You know, the there are opportunities there. You know, you gotta go after them, but the opportunity is there. You can't more than any, I don't know, I mean, I've never lived anywhere else, but you know, um, don't get me wrong, this country has a lot of issues, but but for brown people and black people and people like me, I don't think I would have had the opportunities anywhere else in the world than here in the United States, so. I have to throw in a small plug and embarrass you just a little bit. Um, you are one of the major reasons that I was able to go to school where I went to school, so thank you for that. Um, but I think it goes to, to a bigger phenomenon besides just embarrassing you, which I mean, is always a plus <laughs> um, that, you know, the reason that, that representation and increasing diversity in schools is so important is because, you know, we help each other out as well. I mean, you, you helped lay the groundwork for me and in the hopes that when I, when I succeed with this elite education that you help provide me, I will be able to, to do that for, for other black and brown kids. And, like you said, you know, your siblings all went to college and kind of left a roadmap for you. I have been helping my brother, who's a freshman at Mizzou this year, kind of yeah. navigate his first year in college because, you know, been there, done that. And yeah. and I think that's maybe something that doesn't get talked about as much in the, the diversity representation discussion. I mean, yes, it's great to to build an inclusive community where all points of view are being held, but, you know, opening the door a crack allows us to open it wider for people who oh, come absolutely, on absolutely. after this. I mean, I mean, you know, it's all about paying it forward, I think, you know, so, you know, the opportunity to help you was a no-brainer. You know, you're, you know, you're a smart Latina woman who had an opportunity to go to one of the best universities in the, in the world, and there was no way that I was going to, you know, <laughs> sit back and say, oh, it's too bad that you can't do that when I could help. And I, I do it again in a heartbeat. And, you know, and I think you're right. You'll pay it forward with your brother, with other people, with things like this. And, um, and, and, and I think that's what makes it a little different when you're, when you're Latino and you go to college and you, or you reach a certain level. I think all of us always feel, at least in my family, we've always felt that, you know, we were lucky to have this and our job now is to pay it forward. Just like, you know, my aunt and uncle, right. They, they, I, you know, growing up, I didn't know I was poor. I mean, I was in the Bronx. I had everything I ever wanted. And this was on, on a salary of a janitor and a nurse's aide. And not till I went to Hotchkiss that I realized that I was not rich. I, I thought I was very rich. But, you know, <laughs> but they sacrificed, you know, for me. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm lucky now that I can, you know, take care of my kids. But, you know. And other people's kids. And other people. And, well, you know, and people that. I, I, you know, I think are an exception. <laughs> Which I think is great because you didn't actually know me that well, but now you're basically my your dad. Your mother is very proud of you. <laughs> he uh, talks about it a lot <laughs> to <laughs> everyone. Um, but I think that's that's a really, that's an aspect of, of our communities, respective communities that I'm, most proud of I think is yeah. is the the idea that we're constantly laying the groundwork for the next generation to to be better than us it's cooperative rather than competitive which yeah. Yeah. is is a change you know I have a lot of um very wealthy Caucasian friends who aren't really that close with their their families immediate or extended because they're constantly in a one-upping 
competition yeah. who can be the most successful for like your own reasons and so being a part yeah. of a community a where culture. it really is like you know like i i i never in a million years thought anything it's like my kids want to go to college i will pay for their college and if they go to medical school i will pay for that <laughs> let me tell you i have partners that if their kids didn't get a scholarship to college they weren't good i mean these are doctors that make a shitload of money <laughs> and i was like and, you know I, I hear this kind of like, you're not going to pay for your kid's college why you know i mean I, so anyway it's just a different maybe it's a different culture it's a different uh, but you know uh it, it, it's it's uh, it's it's part of our upbringing and uh, even in even in college and medical school you know again in medical school i gravitated to my best friend was mexican and you know but it was uh, cooperative you know we we helped each other and, and we helped the kids the guys behind us coming through like and and um and that's what got me through medical school. So. Well, we're all glad that it did. So, okay, so you came from the Bronx and then went to Connecticut and then to Boston and then to Stanford and then back to Kansas City. So you've been in a variety of different yeah. um, American cultures. You've been in, you know, fancy privilege and more urban areas. And now you're settled in the nice Midwestern culture. Um, what I are the red state? <laughs> yeah, yay! What are the, what are the benefits and drawbacks of each? Do you think, uh, like personally and and as a Puerto Rican? So for me, um, you know, the biggest drawback of being in Kansas was missing my community, right? Like, you know, like I said, I I miss Puerto Rican food. I miss you know, I miss my siblings and I, I miss a community. I, I miss a bigger Puerto Rican community, no doubt. Um, having said that, you know, I spent time in, in San Francisco and I spent time in Boston and those were great cities and I grew up in New York, but truthfully uh, to raise a family, you know, the Midwest turned out to be a great place to raise my kids and have them, you know, succeed. Um, now I had to adopt or adapt to being in Kansas, you know, like I don't speak politics very often with anybody because, you know, this is a very red state. I really don't speak religion very much with anybody, <laughs> you know? So, so my, the way I adapt, and, and this is with people that don't know me, I stick to very superficial topics, you know, how those chiefs doing? You know, that's a safe topic. So that, that, so for me, it just, it took, um adapting uh because of my you know adapting to being in the midwest and and I, you know people in terms of my experience here you know uh, other than knowing my by my last name i think people don't know where i'm from you know and so when i see patients uh you know sometimes they ask me if i'm mexican some people have asked me if i'm jewish you know they don't know. um but you know i've had some experiences here in the midwest especially when i did outreach in small towns where you know you get the odd question like so rios what, what kind of name is that uh, you know and i said well i was born in new york city it's american nice evasion <laughs> and then i said my parents were born in puerto rico and you know so i mean people you know you know they everybody has their way of kind of Kind of asking their their question you know like uh, you know whether i went to medical school in the united states or not and things like that that comes up it used to come up more when i worked in johnson county you know at research medical center in the, in the middle of the inner city nobody gives a hoot <laughs> So super interesting parallel. Very glad you brought it up. Um, I talked to my neighbor, Dr. Dr. Berrigan King now, uh, CLO, who's a dentist and from Mexico. And she kind of illustrated how, you know, a lot of her white patients will sometimes question her expertise, but she's found that she's able to build a stronger bond with her Spanish speaking patients because she's able to talk to them in their native language. Um, do you find it, one, do you run into challenges serving white clientele as a doctor? And two, do you have stronger bonds with your patients of color because you're also of color? So interesting. So a lot of the uh, sort of Caucasian patients, right, 
um, they tend to kind of look you up before they come see you, right? They, they Google. And so I have the advantage when they Google my name, they see Harvard and Stanford. And that pretty much legitimizes me and their view. So uh, I rarely get questioned anything. And that has nothing to do with me personally. It's just, you know, people are impressed by those names. I could be, you know, shitty stocked around, but they are very impressed by those names. And hence that gives me legitimacy amongst like, you know, the Johnson County crowd. Um, now, in my practice, you know, patients that, that I see that don't speak English, you can almost see like this wave of relief that comes over their face. Again, it has nothing to be, do with whether they, they think I'm a good doctor or not. But when I walk in there and I speak to them in Spanish, it's like, they like, you can almost see them relax. Like, oh my God, I can actually, you know, communicate with this person and tell them what I'm feeling and not have to kind of figure out or sign language or write or, or use a blue phone with an interpreter. And, um, and it, it's just a huge difference. It's just, a, it's always been that way. Even in medical school, you know, the, uh, my, my in as a medical student was when I was, you know, I did a lot of my rotations at San Jose hospitals, which was, I had a big Mexican community. And so, you know, they needed somebody to interpret like they fall wheels from the back of the pack as a medical student. And, you know, and it, so being able to speak Spanish, being able to speak Spanish to your patient who only speaks Spanish is, you know, it, it, it's an instant bond, even if they're Mexican or Guatemala, it doesn't matter. It's just, but if they can understand what I'm saying, and even in my, my, my Spanish right now is, is a mess, especially when it comes to like trying to speak medical Spanish, but they don't care. They just, they are so relieved. And, and like I said, it's, it's, it's almost physical. You can see it. Um, so yeah, it, it makes a huge difference, I think. So this goes towards a couple things. One, the need for diversity in all professions, but particularly professions that have such important effects. Like you're a doctor, your work affects people's health. And, and so being able to connect with your patients to get them to trust you, to trust the advice that you're giving, to be able to, to know what they're actually experiencing is super important. Um, and also kind of plays into, I think the lack of diversity plays into kind of the distrust that people of color have with fancy yeah. professions like, like the medical field. And it's, you know, really unfortunate that all of these implicit biases, um, particularly against black people, black women, um, kind of have such a serious effect, you know, our, our, the mortality rate for black mothers giving birth is like three times the mortality weight yeah. rate for white mothers. And so, you know, having black doctors, black women doctors being able to, to come in and understand what their patients are oh, going it, through. It, it, I'll tell you, in any profession, and you'll see this when you, as an attorney, when you, when, when you can bond with someone over the culture, you know, and, and it, you know, they just, it just, you know, I don't even know how to explain it, but there's like, you know, like when I go into a room and it's an older Hispanic woman, you know, instead of referring to her as a senora so-and-so, I call her, you know, if her first name is Maria, I say Doña Maria. And, you know, but that's the way I grew up referring to the older people that were my, my, my parents' friends. But that's an, like, they, they look at you like, you know, I haven't been called Doña anybody in ages, but, but they like it. They're like, wow, that reminds me of, you know, you know, my home. And so, you know, little things like that make go a long way. And if you can understand, you know, you can bond over what kind of food you eat or, you know, their diet. I mean, it just, it just makes a, a, a huge difference in that interaction. And if they, you know, the fact that you respect where they're from, you understand where they're from, you understand their concerns sometimes, you know, like, you know, those people remind me of all the people that I grew up with in my church, you know, and so it, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a big difference, but, you know, you mentioned there's a big distrust of medicine and, and that plays into this whole COVID thing. I mean, you know, there's a lot of Hispanics out there that are very fearful of this vaccine based on no, you know, scientific data, but just a, an implicit sort of distrust of the medical field. 
And uh, part of, you know, I mean, part of the job of those of us that are Hispanic in the medical community is to try to convince people that it's safe and that it's beneficial because the reason that this, that this virus is affecting you know, Hispanic communities and black communities is because of the, all the comorbidities that, you know, all the diabetes and the hypertension and all this and, and the obesity. These are the patients that don't do well when they get infected. And so that's, uh, and, and because, you know, the social things like, you know, usually grandma lives with, you know, a lot of families, you know, their grandma lives with the parents and the kids and there's just no way of, you know, there's a lot of issues. Couple of quick points in here. So I realize that some people watching this might not know the difference between Doña and Senora, which is is totally fair. Um, so like originally Doña and Don are, are Spanish terms for kind of like nobility, like Lord and Lady. Um, uh, Don Quixote. Right. <laughs> He's which total sidetrack, but like Nobility and wealth are totally divorced from each other um, in Europe, especially. So like Don Quixote is broke, but he's from a noble <laughs> family. So he gets to be called Don Quixote, which I think is great. Um, but but Don and Doña are, you know, were originally reserved for the nobility and and since then have kind of been adopted as as terms of, of respect Respected. and endearment Respected. for the older members of, of Latino communities. Um, Senora is just like, Senora is like correct, but it's very formal, yeah, I guess. It, just doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't feel right sometimes. It, just it doesn't, doesn't vibe. Right. Like doesn't a cute little old lady, she's a Senora, but she's like, she's, but she's like, don't react don't more, but more warmly like, to Doña. Yeah, and, and, and that's why I use it because it's very much for me, you know, the way, my way of showing respect uh, for, for the, my older patients that are Hispanic and I think they appreciate it. And, and you're right, like the senora doesn't, doesn't roll off my tongue right. And, and especially if they have a hyphenated last name, that's like long, you know, <laughs> so the doña and, and don just make it easier. <laughs> yes, okay, second of all, um, I think um, kind of a misconception, unfortunately, is that a lot of, of immigrants in general that can't speak English, not just Spanish speaking immigrants, but immigrants in general who can't speak English um, are dealing with kind of a double whammy in, in society. They're dealing with having to go through interpreters or struggle through a second language. But they're, you know, with that is kind of this, this assumption that people are uneducated or unintelligent well, well, um, okay. because you can't fluently converse in, in the native language, even right. though the U.S. doesn't have an official language, I would like to reiterate that for anybody listening, the United States of America does not have an official language. <laughs> thank you. That's, thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Okay, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's kind of a double-edged sword because not only are you struggling to, to communicate what you're going through, you're also going through, coming up against this perception that you're uneducated or don't know what you're talking about just because you can't fluently communicate in in English um, in this country. So just like to stress again how important it is to have doctors of various languages, cultures, backgrounds, um, being able to to talk to their patients and understand what they are feeling so that they can better treat their symptoms. Um, you know, medical care is sometimes less than optimal for non-English speaking patients. And that's not a reflection on the doctor that's just a reflection on this this language barrier that you know a person isn't adequately able to describe their symptoms lots of things get lost in translation it's really difficult to it's impossible to to translate word for word and get a, the meaning correctly between yeah. spanish I mean, and english things, uh, i think a lot of things happen in that situation you know, if you are thinking that someone needs a procedure and now you have to explain it to someone and it has to be an interpreter and they don't understand, you know, all these, that becomes a barrier, you know? So maybe some doctors will be less likely to, because that takes extra time, right? That sitting down and explain that through an interpreter, that's another 30 minutes of your day. Whereas if it was an English speaking patient, it'd be a five minute discussion. So, you know, that results in less care or less optimal care, I think. And so, you know, and it's at all levels, it's just not the doc. I mean, we need people that, you know, at all levels of, law, all levels of medicine, nursing, 
you know, physical therapy, all those, all those times, because this is, this is a, a problem across the board. Absolutely. And something that you mentioned a little bit earlier was COVID having a disproportionate effect on black and brown communities due to a lot of underlying health conditions. And I think, you know, that's just like another factor to keep in mind is that black and brown people who live in are more likely to live in lower income situations. And when you are from a lower income household, you can't spend five dollars on broccoli for half a meal when you can spend five dollars on at McDonald's and feed five people. And so you're more prone to underlying health conditions, which makes you more likely to need medical attention. And because of your income status, less able to receive right. medical care to to follow up on procedures, to to pay for your medication, to have insurance that lowers, you know, your copay enough to be able to go to the doctor. <laughs> There's, you know, a lot um, of factors that affect black and brown people's ability to go to a doctor, trust a doctor, follow up, do their proper follow ups, pay for proper procedures, pay for proper medication, take the medication like they're supposed to. And sometimes you just can't abstain from environmental risks that you're advised against. It's uh, extremely complex taking care of patients, uh, black, brown that are from a low income uh, 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 community, just because, you know, sometimes they have to decide between food and medicine. I mean, it's that, it becomes that simple. And, you know, so um, even if they want to get their medicines, sometimes they can't. And sometimes they can't come to the doctor's appointments because there's a copay. It's just, uh, it's a, you know, to me, the medicine is actually the easier part. It's the social part that is, the, the, you know, and it's, also important not to get frustrated as a physician and, and you know, take it out on your patients. Like, why are you taking the medicine that prescribed? You know, it's like, well, I can't afford the medicine to be prescribed. <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, I got to eat or my kid has to eat. So, you know, it's, it's just a, having said that, I, I've never been happier than working where I am. You know, I, I've wow. worked in Johnson County. I've worked with research. Just let me say, I walked in there and it felt like home. You know, like, the, again, it's just like, the faces of the people walking through that hospital reminded me of all the people I grew up with. And so I, you know, and, and, and the people that worked there reminded me of the people I grew up with. And so I was like, wow, this is, this is where I belong. And well, that, we're very that, happy to have you. Uh, um, I'd also we're like to take to a second that. to highlight how diverse Research's cardiology group is. Um, so my mom is a, is a nurse at Research's cardiology office, and uh, she works for Dr. Lawrence, who is Black, and we have Dr. Rios, who's Puerto Rican, and um, Dr. Weisberg is Jewish, yeah. <laughs> and Dr. Deepak is Indian. There's it's a very diverse group. a lot of diversity <laughs> and and you see that reflected in their patient pool. And that's really important because when you're in a low income area already, you're going uphill socially, um, you're dealing with distrust of the medical field. So if you can go into a doctor's office where people look like you, it yeah. just makes it so much easier to work with patients, to get them to trust what you're telling them, trust the medication that you're prescribing and just lays a foundation for a really healthy doctor-patient relationship. Yeah, I, I agree. Yay for that. Uh, <laughs> um, want to get your quick opinion on this. So we're dealing with a lot of things that um, are making it difficult to convince Black and Brown communities to get the COVID vaccine, but more than that, to find COVID vaccine availability. Mm -hmm. um, it's not rolling out as smoothly as as it should in black and brown communities, especially when you consider that black and brown communities are disproportionately affected by COVID. Um, prime example of this is uh, the recent investigation going on in Florida because the county commissioner uh, at Governor DeSantis's, uh, under Governor DeSantis's um, kind of declaration of how they were going to deal with the COVID vaccine, created a VIP list of people and handpicked zip codes that would be getting the COVID vaccine. And surprise, surprise, they were the two wealthiest zip codes in Florida. And the VIP list included um, herself and, and some of her friends. So um, 
lots of things to unpack there. First of all, you have people um, saying that we we don't need the vaccine here because we have the lowest rate of COVID transmission. Um, yes, you are in a very wealthy zip code and that plays into why you have such a low rate of transmission. Yeah. Um, Florida's numbers are a little dodgy to begin with due to some political back and forth that's going on about data. But what it boils down to at the very base is that a Caucasian County Commissioner on a all Caucasian County Commission board at the request of a Caucasian governor <laughs> made the decision to make the COVID vaccine available only to the two wealthiest zip codes in Florida, which are shockingly primarily Caucasian. So just wanted to get a quick opinion on that. Quick little comment. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, uh, unfortunately, it's like anything else, right, in this country, right? Money helps, right? Um, and and that, that, that's going to be the case in, in even with this rollout of the COVID vac uh, vaccinations. I don't have a great sense of how that's rolling out here in Kansas City. Um, you know, I have my patients have come by and I've asked a lot of them uh, just today just to get a feel for, you know, how many of them are going to get vaccinated and, and if they are, how easy has it been? And surprisingly, uh, I was very happy just about all of my elderly uh, and today it's just mostly African-American patients all were, you know, 100% going to get vaccinated and we're actively, you know, aggressively seeking out, uh, you know, sites. Uh, I was pretty impressed by how how aggressive and how, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, how resourceful they've been. Uh, I, I don't think it's an easy, you know, a lot of it is online registering not everybody has a computer you know i'm sure trying to get things on the phone so i don't have a great sense of how it's rolling out in sort of jackson county where i work um but i was impressed by you know like uh one lady was getting it through her church um the truman medical center another medical center that serves an inner city community is is providing i don't know what research itself is doing in terms of the community i kind of have to look into that um, but it, you know, I, I, I think here in the Midwest, uh, um, I think the rollout has been a little slow, but, uh, it's, it's picking up. And I think, um, you know, I, I don't get the sense that people are jumping lines or getting, you know, uh, preferred care granted, you know, in, in some area codes, it's just more efficient because they, you know, they have more money and can do it better and and you know everybody in that area code has a computer and it can log on and, you know. well if it makes you feel any better i can testify that missouri's rollout is going significantly better than indiana's <laughs> um i'm i'm eligible for the vaccine in missouri i'm not eligible for the vaccine in indiana oh. so you gotta come home um yeah that's unfortunate <laughs> um all right well, our hour's about up. Are there any last minute topics you would like to touch on or are we good to go? No, I, I just want to thank you for having me. Um, you know, as uh, I was surprised you wanted to talk to me, but I'm happy. <laughs> and I, and, thank you uh, for coming. Of course, I want to talk to you. You're <laughs> um, wonderful and incredibly impressive. And I love you. <laughs> um, I'm going to sign off as I always do with a quote from Claudia Flores. Uh, we must be impatient for change. Let us remember that our voice is a precious gift and we must use it. The program is brought to you by the Kansas City Business Association. 